Okay. Sigma Corporation of America is now live. Welcome everyone and uh, welcome to another Facebook Live Q&A session streaming once again from the cozy confines of the Sigma Corporation conference room. Uh, I'm Nick and today I'd like to welcome three experts to help us learn a little bit more about our newest lens, the Sigma 100 to 400 DGDN OS Contemporary. And uh, with us today are Sigma Tech Rep, Aaron Norberg from the great Pacific Northwest. How you doing? Hey, doing well, thanks for having me. Uh, also, we have Sigma Ambassador Jim Kepnick from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and he's used this lens for practically everything in just a few short weeks. So welcome, Jim. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And we are also welcoming uh, Annabelle Deflux, another Sigma Ambassador who specializes in animal photography, um, not only animal portraits, but also action, which we'll get into in a little bit. And uh, she does portraits as well, and she's hailing from Los Angeles. Welcome, Annabelle. Hi, everyone. So uh, everyone who's on the stream now, thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to be taking some questions along the way. Um, Aaron will, will tackle the uh, technical questions. If you have any questions about the experiences of our ambassadors with their new lens, uh, feel free to pose those questions to them. So let's get started. Uh, let's start by talking about the star of the show and uh, get a little bit of background information on the new 100 to 400 contemporary lens. So Aaron, I'll pose this to you. Um, like we discussed on our prior live stream, this is a redesign of uh, another 100 to 400 that we have available for Canon EF and Nikon F. Um, same focal length, uh, same aperture range, but a very different lens in many ways. Yeah, even seeing them side by side, you might uh, be mistaken to think that they are the same, but um... Unlike what we saw with some of the art series lenses that were initially offered in the mirrorless mounts, this is a completely different optical formula. It was designed specifically for the shorter flange distances that we see in mirrorless camera platforms. A couple other big differences between this lens and the existing uh, Nikon and Canon DSLR mount version that we also make. Uh, this lens uses uh, stepping motors rather than ultrasonic or hypersonic style motors. Um, and this is a better fit for continuous autofocus when we want to be recording um, video. It also is um, going to enable faster communication between this lens and the camera that it's mounted to than what our SLR version would via the MC11 or a similar type adapter because it speaks the native protocol of the camera it's mounted to. So much faster autofocus, especially continuous autofocus. It's also fully compatible with all the advanced features of these newer uh, mirrorless cameras like face and eye detection autofocus. That's a huge difference between the two. Now you mentioned and mirrorless cameras. That's what's important about this lens is that it is designed specifically for mirrorless systems such as Sony's E-mount and L-mount cameras, including our own Sigma FP and Panasonic Lumix S-series cameras and uh, Leica bodies as well. <laughs> Did I get that all right? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, the other big difference optically, it does have a slightly different formula. Um, and the big difference that I noticed comparing the two is that this new DGDN version has one more low dispersion element than the existing SLR version. Mm -hmm. So color accuracy is even higher. And the optical performance, if you look at the MTF charts, and I'm sure some of the samples that we're going to see later here today, uh, while the existing 100 to 400 has been a great performer for the Nikon and Canon platforms, this lens delivers even better imaging performance edge to edge throughout its range. Um, and it also manages to be a little bit smaller than the SLR version, uh, despite the fact that it's a higher optical performer. So let's get a little bit of input from our ambassadors today. Uh, we'll start with Jim. Um, what were your initial impressions of the lens? Uh, we got you an early copy and you immediately put it to good use. You know, the first thing that I noticed, I, I went, out to the local zoo to shoot some animals and, and some people shots is just how much lighter it is, how much more balanced the camera and lens felt in my hand. You know, if I carried it one handed, it just had really nice balance. It seemed lighter, uh, just so much easier to carry. Um, I'm not sure what the, the tech specs are and how much less it weighs, but it feels like it weighs a lot less. And it just, like I said, it just has nicer balance, I think. You've got one mounted on your camera uh, right next to you, I believe, if you want to just show everyone. That is a Sony A9, I A9 believe. A9 Mark II. Um, and I've also, I 
took the tripod collar off my 105 because I read that works. So I put a tripod collar on so I could, there were a few things I needed to be on a tripod for. Um, so I put that on, it's a good alternative, but I'm waiting for the, the original one for this lens to come out. I hear there's a few extra little goodies with it. Well, it's, I guess it's as good a time as ever to mention it. So it, uh, we do have a tripod collar that's made specifically for this lens. While the 105 can be used on it, um, we recommend this one because it has a couple little extra features. Um, on the bottom, bottom, bottom of the Arca Swiss plate, uh, there are a couple little holes here where you would put these tiny little stopper screws in. And that is basically to keep it from sliding on your Arca Swiss tripod when you're shooting video or when you're shooting stills. But I think it's mostly designed because this is a little bit more of a video centric lens. And it also comes with a strap. So a couple little additional benefits um, for that tripod collar over the existing 105 millimeter art version. Uh, Annabelle, you had a shorter time with the lens. Unfortunately, we should get you out another copy soon, but <laughs> what did you think of the lens? What were your initial impressions when you first put it on your Sony camera? I mean, immediately I felt like my Sony a7R4 was so beautifully balanced with it because with mirrorless systems, we are really looking for something that is a little bit more lightweight and a little bit more compact. That's initially what really attracted me to mirrorless systems in the first place. And this lens feels very, very beautifully balanced. It doesn't feel like it's overcumbering the camera too much. And as well as that, for the kinds of photography that I do, I am going almost exclusively handheld. And the way that I tested this lens out was at a dog sporting event where um, the option of a monopod or a tripod is not very feasible for the kind of photography that I do there. And it being a lot lighter weight really allowed me to shoot the dogs for a significantly longer period of time without feeling any sort of fatigue. And as well as that, its size was really beautifully maneuverable too. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like the, uh, the first thing that comes to mind when you put this lens in your hand is that, wow, there's so much range and it's this light. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the, not only the optical design, but also the materials that it's made out of. This is one of our contemporary lenses, so it's not made out of uh, magnesium alloy or metal. Like This is a thermally stable composite material, I believe, Aaron, is that right? It's primarily um, what we would call thermally stable composite. It's a blend that doesn't react to heat or cold the way that metals can. And for that reason, it's a, one of the materials we use predominantly in our lenses. So that's something that and Annabelle had mentioned that if you haven't read Annabelle's uh, blog post on our blog, <laughs> uh, you should check it out. She mentioned specifically that this lens uh, remained nice and cool even under 100 degree heat in Southern California. And I imagine the same would be true if you were out in the, uh, the wilds of uh, the Arctic. So um, that's one really nice benefit of this lens. So um, anything else that we should mention, technically speaking, Aaron, there are a few different uh, switches here on, on the side of the lens that uh, not every photographer might know uh, what they're for offhand. Of course, there's an autofocus, manual focus switch that's self-explanatory, but what about a focus limiter and this AFL button? What do those do for the uninitiated? Yeah, so the focus limiter, uh, with a lens like this that has such a broad range of distances that it can focus through, um, the focus limiter is really there to help us um, curtail the lens from trying to focus through certain um, distances when we know that our subject won't be in that distance. So on the lens here, the first position is full. So that's the full range near to far that the lens is capable of focusing through. The next one, the position in the middle, is the far range. Yeah, exactly. So if you're only photographing things at a distance and you're not photographing anything in close proximity, by limiting the lens to that far region, uh, it can speed up autofocus acquisition and tracking because the lens won't try to move through as great a range. And then closest to the mount is the, uh, the near range. So just the same uh, with a different distance applied. If you're only photographing things in relatively close proximity, we can prevent the lens from trying to focus at the far distances to speed up tracking and acquisition. And then below that, the AFL button. Um, by default, this is an autofocus lock button, but uh, another one of the neat features of mirrorless cameras compared to a lot of the DSLR cameras that the older lens would have been designed for, many of those cameras now feature the ability to reprogram buttons on the camera body. And this AFL button works in just the same way. 
when it's mounted to a compatible camera, you can reprogram that button to carry out any number of functions that you'd want to reassign it to from within the camera's menu. And this, of course, there's one more switch on there, and that's for the optical stabilizer. It has two modes. The uh, first mode is essentially for handheld use, and number two would be primarily for panning. Um, and Jim, I know you do a lot of uh, sports photography or shooting power boats on the lakes up there in Oshkosh. How did you find that the OS modes work for you? I thought it worked good, and it was obvious that there was a difference. Um, I, um, do you want to see pictures while we're doing this? Yeah, you know what? Let's uh, do some screen I sharing. I can give you and, uh, um, some Maybe we can illustrate that exact point of how the uh, objects moving from side to side functioned well with the uh, OS2 mode. All right, are you seeing that one? I sure am. All right, that is at uh, 50th of a second, at zoomed out to 400 millimeters, and that was in mode two, and I'm just panning the boat as it comes through, and um, shooting with a Sony A9 Mark II, and I think, um, you know, it, it's extremely sharp. Uh, you know, 50th really of a second is actually kind of, of is actually kind of mind blowing. You know, I, I mean, a lot of that has to do with your steady hand and your talent uh, as a photographer. But um, this is yeah. where I insert the laugh. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, anything I'm trying to give that, you a compliment, Jim. <laughs> I know. Thank you very much. But uh, you know, I've, I've got to um, you know attribute it to you know a good lens and. Um, and remembering to make use when you're in in a, a panning situation. I know I think you talked in the the previous session that it doesn't exactly have to be a panning situation, maybe. But um, that mode, you know, remember to switch to mode two if you're in something like this. But you know, I was also in mode one. Um, I think for this, and this is I think like one four thousandth of a second. So going from a 50th of a second to one four thousandths, giving you, uh, you know, the two options that you have to totally freeze the subject or to give that feeling of motion. And when you have the subject uh, racing at you in that manner, because of the range, because of the wide range, you have such a, uh, a great deal of opportunities to get the shot that you're looking for. You know, and it, it locked on focus and just did not leave. Annabelle shot in a situation very similar to this, although with very different subjects. Um, you went to a, and I don't know how to describe it. It's not a race. I guess it's time trials, sprints. Explain That's it to us. Coursing <laughs> ability test for dogs. And basically dogs are chasing a lure on a hundred yard dash and they're timed to see how quickly they make it through the finish line, which is a lot of fun to watch if you ever get the opportunity to do so. so go ahead and share that screen. And the main thing about photographing dog sporting events is you want to make sure that your equipment is not in any way distracting the pups from what they're doing, which means that I am shooting from very, very far away, essentially at the very end of that 100 yard dash. And this lens was really beneficial in being able to zoom in all the way and capturing the dogs as if they were a lot closer to me than they actually were. But as you can see in some of these images, if it's gonna let me scroll through, there we go. This is actually the very beginning of that dash. It zoomed in all the way at 400 millimeters. And although I'm someone who really, really enjoys shooting with an extremely shallow depth of field, even at 6.3, I believe is what it goes to the end, mm -hmm. on that f-stop, it still beautifully separates the subject from the background to make sure that this dog is nicely isolated. Um, and as well as that, as you can see with the zoomed in version, it is so beautifully sharp, beautifully sharp. I've not had a lens been able to capture focus this quickly on a subject that is this far away. And on top of that, I am shooting with a Sony a7R IV, which has animal eye tracking mode on it. And this yes. lens communicated so beautifully that it actually was able to find exactly where this dog's face was. It's, uh, it, it's amazing to think about how far we've come with autofocus technology that you could actually nail autofocus on the eyes of a dog uh, scampering at you from that distance. Um, it's really quite amazing. It is um, wild. That is for sure. So 
overall absolutely impressed with this lens and I definitely see it as a lens that I think a lot of animal action photographers would really, really appreciate for so many different reasons. Absolutely. Now, if you were to use this in other situations, um, maybe if you wanted to get, uh, I hesitate to say portraits because it's an animal, but dog portraits. Um, I know you, you were able to get out into the woods and get a few shots. Do you happen to have those on hand? Oh, goodness. I do not. Oh. Have them, but I can pull them up. Maybe I have them. Yeah, if you have um, them. But in the meantime, why don't we uh, grab a question here from the, from the Facebook audience. Um, the question here is about teleconverters. So, Aaron, this, this lens does have a teleconverter made for it, uh, the 1.4x and a 2x, but they are for L mount only at this time. Um, just correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's the situation. That's correct, yes. Okay. Do we know any, uh, if there's any compatibility with this lens and Sony's versions of their teleconverters? Uh, because we are a, an active partner with Sony in that ecosystem, there's no technical reason why their teleconverters shouldn't work with our lens. Okay. That being said, given the current climate of um, trying to remain uh, safe at home, I have not had access to the Sony teleconverters, uh, okay. so I haven't been able to confirm that firsthand. Okay. Annabelle, did you happen to get those shots pulled up? I've got them. I saved the day. <laughs> yes. I was like, I remember sending them to you. Here we go. Yes. All right. Can you guys see? <laughs> All right. So that uh, big fella in the middle is a wolf dog. And yes. uh, forgive me for forgetting his name. He does have his a pretty cool name. Phelan. And Phelan. he has an Instagram account called Running with wolf dogs. Um, he's a mid-content wolf dog. And a big benefit to this lens as well is that if you're shooting animals that might get a little distracted, if you're very close by to them, you can stand significantly further away and be able to beautifully zoom in to capture those gorgeous portrait shots. Um, a lot of the times when people come to me asking for advice on pet photography, I find that not being a part of that situation tends to yield the best images and the best way to not be a part of that situation is to situate yourself significantly further away so that the animal is no longer distracted by your presence which of course this lens exceptionally excels at because you are able to sit pretty far back. But because of its zooming range, you're also able to adapt if the animal starts moving towards you or starts moving further away. <laughs> Good point. Um, Jim, I believe you had some uh, portraits of humans. Do you uh, care to share I, a couple of those with us? Let's, that's a great suggestion. Um, <laughs> yes, let me do a little screen sharing here. Something I mentioned yesterday on our social channel is that uh, don't sleep on a telephoto zoom as a portrait lens uh, because while it's not traditionally thought of as something that's going to get you that uh, really blurry background and uh, background separation, uh, you can achieve that simply by using a longer focal length. And then you also have uh, a lens that is so versatile it can be used in countless other situations. So it's a really good value. And lest we forget to mention the price of this lens, it's $949 for all of that range. Yeah, and I prefer, you know, 70 to 200, or in this case, the 100 to 400. It's, it's just so versatile for so many things, you know, sports and portraits and, and just about anything you can think of. Um, I was sort of uh, keying off the previous discussion that you had last week, where you're talking about how good is the uh, stabilization at 400. So my friend Aaron and I went out to shoot some things at dawn and then we came back and we were doing some things in an alley, uh, some portraits. And I set it at a 50th of a second and I'm shooting it at uh, 400 millimeters. And this thing is tack sharp. So excellent stabilization. And this is just available light. Uh, and, Jim, Jim, can you oh. bring up a couple of the uh, uh, full screens? Um, we're looking at the thumbnails right now. You are. Yeah. Did that do it? No. No. <laughs> That's okay. Um, all right. All of Jim's shots basically are on our Facebook feed. So uh, you should be able to uh, check those out and get a good idea of exactly how uh, sharp the lens is and how well it performs in those situations, even in uh, dim situations like this. And um, 
it, we're, we're fortunate that at this time in, you know, our, the technological development of cameras that we're able to shoot in pretty dark situations with a lens that traditionally you would say, well, it's a bit on the slow side. It's uh, F5 through uh, 6.3. But because of um, sensor technology, we're able to get a whole lot more performance out of a lens that ends up being um, inexpensive and very, very versatile. So um, Aaron, maybe you can uh, give us a little bit more insight on that. Sure. Uh, making the aperture more moderate value, like five to six, three, goes a really long way in downsizing the overall size of that optical formula. Uh, making it a constant, say F5.6 or F4 would make it a lot larger and more expensive because it would be a lot more glass in there. Uh, mm -hmm. And with this lens, we were really trying to strike that balance between portability and optical performance. Um, and I think if you haven't shot at focal lengths, like in the 100 to 400 range before, you might be surprised by how shallow your depth of field is natively, even at what might seem like a small aperture, like f5 or f6.3, uh, just because of the focal length that you're achieving. As your focal length increases, your depth of field naturally decreases as well. So uh, there are de definitely some instances where you'd want to have a more shallow depth of field at a long focal length like that. And there are specialty lenses like our 120 to 300 has a constant f2.8. But just for comparison's sake, to keep that uh, fast aperture value, even with a shorter range, that lens is closer to six and a half pounds rather than the two and a half pounds of this lens here. So there's always a trade off there. And I think for a lot of people, this is going to be a much more practical um, compromise. One of the other major benefits of this lens is, uh, and I mentioned it before, of course, but the price and at 949 um, it's really hard to go wrong when you're comparing this against other lenses on the market uh, in that similar range in a similar um, focal range and uh, as far as the quality goes I'm from what I've seen on all the reviews and from my own personal use and from the experiences of our own ambassadors here uh, not only Jim and Annabelle but um, Liam Duran and uh, uh, Kedron Franklin, who joined us on the last live stream and was able to shoot a couple portraits, the optical quality is absolutely there. And uh, this is a lens that we're really proud of. If anyone wants to join in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I absolutely agree. I mean, I can be a little difficult, like hard on lenses because I do put them through the ringer. And um, as I mentioned, the blog post, that dog sporting event, and even hiking in the woods with Phelan was putting a lens through a ringer because it really was exposed to so many elements such as heat or just rapid cold or moist air and dirt and dust and the occasional bump. Sorry, Sigma. <laughs> Whenever oh, I didn't know about that. <laughs> when you're actually using it. And it really went through absolutely everything so flawlessly and so beautifully and was still able to capture absolutely incredible images and Whenever I pick equipment, I'm always picking equipment that will make my life easier. And this lens certainly does that because there's a lot less worry about missing focus. There's a lot less worry about the conditions I'm shooting in affecting the quality of the images that come out. So absolutely incredible, incredible piece of equipment, especially at that price. I mean, you really can't go wrong there. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jim, I, I uh, was able to grab a couple uh -huh. of your shots here. So... Um, to speak to the versatility of this lens, this was one of the first shots that you uh, posted uh, several weeks ago, and there it is. You can use the 100 to 400 for commercial photography. You know, and I've heard, um, you know, there, there are the naysayers that say, well, it's not a professional lens. To me, it's a professional lens. I mean, I'm making my living at this, and, and I'm not going to turn a picture into a client that isn't sharp. And... This lens produces sharp pictures. This was for an automotive magazine. Uh, I think we had four, four lights on this at sunset. Um, on the tripod, I was glad that I uh, swapped my tripod mount. And uh, so I was able to do this. Uh, but just such sharpness out of this that, you know, you know you're going to make your client happy. I'll bring up a couple more. Uh, this was... Um, it's just walking around in Milwaukee trying to, uh, I'm kind of a street photographer at heart, so it's maybe a little different walking around with a 100 to 400, but you can't believe uh, the cool results you get. You know, 
sometimes you get the idea that a street photographer carries a 50 or a 40 or, you know, one lens and that's it and it's wide. Right. There, are, you know, it just opens up so many possibilities when you can start zooming into something and cropping in camera. And in this case, I'm watching the clouds reflecting on one side of the building of the real clouds behind it. And it just seemed like such a cool combination. I wanted to get to the, uh, this shot got a lot of great um, response on our social channels and yours, yours as well. Uh, something that uh, was referred to, people can, thought it was fake, basically. <laughs> no, it was, uh, I was actually <laughs> shooting with the FP, doing video so I could do screen capture. So I was feeding the seagulls over on the beach and I decided to pick up the A9 with the 100 to 400. And while they were all zooming around, I just went into tracking mode and tracked them. And, uh, you know, a lot of it comes down to editing. You shoot a lot, but go through and see, you know, what's there. And, uh, and this one just happened to be there. And then we saw some of those portraits, right? We were talking about portraits before. Yeah, that's and... at 100 millimeters. Uh, and that's um, just something it was, um, I've been shooting a couple of singers in town. There's not a lot of performances going on. So it's a good time for them to build up their portfolios. So, and do a little social media push. So this was a local singer. I did get to try some air to airs, which is one of my specialties. Uh, it was really bumpy. I, so it wasn't a fair test in a way, but I think at, it went to 50th of a second. I mean, this thing is just tack sharp. Uh, there is one here where I was able to get the shutter speed down to get a full crop blur at a 60th of a second. Stabilization worked fine in the camera. I mean, just beautifully. Uh, the plane is sharp. There's a good crop blur. Um, you know, it, it's, I think it's a perfect lens for air to air if you're shooting on the ground during an air show with airplanes flying, or if you're in another airplane shooting air to airs like this. And then sports. Sports, I found a high school all, right? game, believe it or not. Uh, I was kind of rusty, but I went through and, uh, and there were a couple. I, I kind of like this with the pitcher keeping his eye on the ball. So I think the overall uh, sentiment here is that this lens is not only affordable and lightweight and uh, very versatile, but um, the performance is there. The performance is there that you would expect from a, a much higher priced lens. And um, as such, this is just something we're really proud of. And again, 949 for this lens. Uh, it also comes with a hood. So if you need to make sure you uh, block out any stray sunlight. And uh, then you can purchase the tripod collar separately. And uh, this does make a difference if you are shooting video or if you are just concerned about um, whether or not the lens is going to affect your camera mount. It's, it's lightweight enough that in my experience, I didn't feel like it was gonna be an issue, especially when you're shooting handheld, it's not something you really consider. But uh, once you pop it on a tripod, um, this might be something you want to invest in. This is a separate accessory. But uh, I think that probably about wraps it up. If you guys have any closing thoughts on this lens, um, I'm not seeing too many questions from the uh, from the audience here. So if you guys want to sort of give us your final thoughts and um, we'll get ready for the weekend. It's only one more day away. <laughs> well, I'll jump in first if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, it's fast focusing. It is extremely sharp. It's economically priced. And, um, you know, it's my go-to lens right now. I keep it on a camera body and throw it in the car every place they go. This lens makes my life so much easier. And again, that is something that I significantly value with, as someone who does do photo shoots nearly every day and I'm constantly on my feet and carrying equipment. And this lens really does make the dog sporting events so much easier. It makes capturing portraits of animals so much easier and overall just such an enjoyable, enjoyable lens to put on my camera. <laughs> Yeah, my perspective was that this lens was just fun. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, I don't do any professional work. Um, you know, I have a side gig, but uh, I brought this lens to the beach. I brought it on hikes. I took it outside with my sons and uh, it was just 
it was perfect for capturing everything that I wanted that I couldn't do with my 24 to 70, which was a lot. Uh, and it really gives you a, a very wide range of perspectives that you can take advantage of. And uh, because it's so lightweight, I was just able to pop it in my backpack or if I had the camera hanging off uh, my side, I barely even noticed it was there. It was no, you know, no heavier than the usual equipment I'm carrying around. As opposed to if I had, let's say 150 to 600, which as compact as the contemporary version is, it's still, you know, pretty hefty. So uh, having something like this, that's a native mount for my Sony camera. Um, as soon as we have these in stock here in the office, I think I'm going to invest in one. <laughs> what about you, Aaron? Yeah, I would say uh, from the technical standpoint, there is nothing out there for Sony E-mount or Leica L-mount owners to get beyond 70 to 200 that combines this level of optical performance with the size, price, and weight. I mean, for anyone uh, who's looking to get out past the 70 to 200, it should be on your short list. But I also think a uh, critical point of that is what you were just saying, how much easier it is to carry around than some of those other super telephoto lenses, even a 70 to 200. This is a lighter weight lens. Mm -hmm. I also don't tend to shoot super long. Uh, I usually shoot on the wider side, but uh, the one outing that I have gotten with this so far was uh, out on hi a hiking trail that I typically wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't have taken like a 70 to 200 or a 150 to 600, but this is small and light enough that I brought it along just in case. And it actually ended up um, coming in really handy getting shots that the 24 to 70 just wasn't getting close enough to. We did just get a question and that's uh, a good topic to bring up is this is something that you would bring along to just capture maybe wildlife when you're out hiking. So does this make a good birding lens? I guess the traditional focal length is probably, uh, you, you'd want to go for something in the 500 to 600 range, but you could certainly make this work. And on a camera like the one that Annabelle is using, which has, I think about 60 megapixels worth of resolution, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. uh, you can crop in and this would make a good birding lens, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. I would say this would be the starting point for that. It would really depend on the size of the animals that you're photographing and the proximity. Um, if you're going to be shooting in like a wildlife reserve where they're not going to be close to you, yeah. you might need longer focal length. But uh, for any L-mount shooters, the fact that we have the two teleconverters that can take this to 560 or 800 millimeters on a full frame, and even further still if you drop it into an APS-C mode, and another critical difference for that type of use compared to the SLR version, typically with an SLR version, if you went beyond the 1.4 teleconverter, most cameras would lose autofocus, uh, especially on the long range of the lens. With the L mount, um, this lens and those teleconverters maintain autofocus throughout their entire range, which is a huge difference in operation in the field compared to some of the older tech and designs that we saw in the DSLR field. Yeah, that is one of the uh, definite benefits of going with the L-mount version of this lens. And um, we've been testing out the uh, FP here at the office with this lens with the teleconverters attached, and we are very pleasantly surprised by the performance of it. So uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Aaron. Um, I guess, guys, that about wraps it up. Um, I'd just like to thank Jim Kepnick and Annabelle DeFlux for joining us on our live stream. And uh, of course, Aaron, thank you so much for uh, taking some time out of your day from the, uh, from the West Coast to uh, answer some questions here on the stream. And I um, guess that's about it. So guys, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the uh, Facebook Live audience for joining us as well. And uh, if you want to watch this, of course, it'll be recorded and we'll put it up on YouTube. And then if you're looking for more information about the 100 to 400 or any other Sigma products, please head to sigmaphoto.com and you can get all of your information there. You can buy direct from us or you can find links to your favorite local dealers. Uh, and then don't forget to follow us on social. Of course, you're already following us here on Facebook, but we're also on Twitter and Instagram. And someone in the office told me about this thing called TikTok. I, I don't know if we're going to get around to that, but we'll see. I want to see you dance. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's why we hired you guys. We're going to make uh... you do it. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us on this uh, little roundtable discussion, and we'll see you next time.